a warm welcome back to you all. Thank you so much for staying with the News World here on Channel 405 and Newsroom Africa. Well, it's just gone 10.30 p.m. Central Africa time, and now we're taking a closer look at our neighboring country, Zimbabwe. Well, it's just been over two months since former President Robert Mugabe died and almost two years since he was ousted from the office. But some Zimbabweans say that life is tougher than ever. Now, the country's economy has been under immense pressure with people grappling soaring prices and shortages of fuel and electricity. Thousands of Zimbabweans have since found themselves reeling from the harsh effects of the deepening economic crisis. Well, the need for reforms in the country are now at its highest. And to discuss this pertinent, or rather these persistent challenges facing that government, I'm now joined in studio by political analyst Mr. Mutuma Mawere and the Zimbabwe Solidarities Forum, Mr. Munjozi Mutandiri. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time and for joining us here on Newsroom Africa, here on Newsworld. I mean, I actually want us to take a closer look at the pain of the actual you know, citizens of Zimbabwe that they're going through you know, this whole deepening economic crisis. But before we actually go through that, I want your reaction on the Wednesday's um, ordeal where say, thousands or rather hundreds of MDC supporters were attacked by police riots in the country. What does this actually signify? It may seem here actually with criticism from several analysts saying that this actually may seem that you know, the current government is now using the same tactics which were used in the old regime. I'll actually start with you, Mr. Motumwa. Okay, when you say a new government, you must uh, reflect on that statement. You may find that the difference between the new and the old is the same. The mindset is the same. The ideas are the same. Robert Mugabe may be gone, but the ideas that informed the choices he made and the people around him are still the same. This journey has taken 39 years plus some months. So the people who are in government today may not be different in terms of outlook. So let's look at what they think is the problem. Mm. They think the problem is external. Mm. They think the problem is caused by some mischief makers. They look at opposition as part of the problem. So they look at the people as a problem. They look at power as the solution. Mm. So the coup d'etat is part of that unlawful seizure of power. But they don't want anyone else to do the same because already a precedent has been set mm. that actually you can remove a constitutional government you borrowing uh, the army. And that has happened already. Mm. And Mr. Mutandiri, this actually really paints you know, a rather grim picture of, of Zimbabwe. And would you say perhaps that this actually sets the country way back? They're crying that we need the sanctions, you know, lifted. But, you know, the picture that we, we're painting to these very same investors that we're trying to attack, tra you know, attract to the country, we're rather chasing them away. So, so I think that, uh, first of all, uh, the behavior we saw yesterday is consistent with a government that was not voted by the people, a government that came to power through a coup. And I think that's, that's mm -hmm. the first point that we must make. But also the barbarism we saw yesterday, coming a day after Minister Naled Pando tried to mm -hmm. highlight the problems that are in Zim and that possibly it's a time to rebuild and a time to move forward. I think it's unfortunate and it takes us way back. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I think that Mnangagwa, when he got into power, he gave people a lot of promises that we are going to reform. People thought that he was willing to break from the culture they had entrenched as NPF and he was Mugabe's right hand man, uh, Mugabe's enforcer. And so when we see today this kind of brutality, and you must know, that what we saw yesterday is not the beginning. The Mohlande Commission, uh, after the 1st of August uh, murder of unarmed civilians, highlighted the issues of policing, that they need to be in line with proper mechanisms of policing internationally. To see that a year later, nothing has been done to correct that behavior, I think it sends a very wrong message and it tells us that uh, whatever the government of Zimbabwe is saying, they are paying lip service. Mm. They are not willing to go all the way 
to reform Zimbabwe to ensure that a stability Zimbabwe is realized. But why are they doing that? Because at the core of what they are doing is to protect power, protect it to what means so that they enrich their pockets. They can continue to loot in the midst of chaos and confusion and, and you know now gentlemen we, we we can actually you know sort of see the kind of challenges which are experienced by zimbabweans you know it's very evident to to the entire world that you know it, it's really really bad in that country with the soaring prices with the with the fuel you know issues and the blackouts and now we've got the healthcare system you know crashing and you know getting crippled by the day now with the drought as well as though we might actually say that it is climate induced but now how do we then describe you know the nature and the characteristics of Zimbabwe's problems and I think that it, it's very important for us before or the, as, the, as a country to move on we first you know really understand the nature and the characteristics of the problems experienced in, in Zimbabwe Mr. Mutumwa. Yeah when you look at the problem statement if it was uh, to be defined, you can see that poverty and wealth are related. The only difference is that wealth is value you have created. Poverty is facing challenges. So if you, took, if you look at the rule of law, where there's rule of law, there's prosperity. Mm -hmm. Where there's freedom, there's prosperity. Where there is government of force, there is no prosperity. So one is the rule of law and respect of the rule of law. And as a region in Southern Africa, Zimbabwe is a signatory to the SADC Treaty. If you look at the SADC Treaty, mm -hmm. it's very clear that part of the mandate of SADC for these countries to come together is to promote and protect the rule of law. Mm -hmm absent the rule of law, then somebody must know there's a problem. What is South Africa's position on Zimbabwe? On sanctions? Where is South Africa? There are no sanctions. And without actually interrupting you over there, um, do you feel that SADC, uh, you know, is, is actually stepping up to the table? Are they playing the role that they actually supposed to be playing with regards to providing assistance? You've just mentioned that Durko held a symposium just recently trying to look at solutions in which can be actually used in bettering the situation. But with all these communities outside Zimbabwe, are we really stepping into, you know, stepping up to the table? And can, are we really the answer, or is South Africa or SADC really the answer no, into just stepping up? Explain on SADC is a club of member states, mm -hmm. it's governments of the individual member states that are represented at SADC. Mm. But you can't expect brothers who come together to create a supranational body to be the enforcers of the rights of citizens in the individual countries. So there's a limitation. Secondly, if you look at the problems in Zimbabwe, political side, the elections were held in 2018, and there's no single SADC member state that has said the elections were rigged. Mm -hmm. That is the EAU, the African Union, there is no single member state who has said there's a problem with elections. Then you now arrive in Zimbabwe. There are people who are saying the biggest problem is that there is no dialogue between two elephants. And those elephants arise from the 2018 elections. So Zimbabweans are talking about something different. Mm. SADC is at one, that there is a legitimate government of the Republic of Zimbabwe led by President Mnangagwa. But in Zimbabwe, there are people who are saying there is no legitimacy. So you have a disconnect. So for SADC to climb outside the current position, there has to be some fundamental changes and a review of things that have already been adopted as mm. 
the correct position. Mm. Let me so actually I, get. I, let me actually give Mr. Mutan the yeah. you know right to reply to yeah. that, and perhaps. So, so I think that um, Tunga captures some of the issues that I think are pertinent in the discussion around Sadak and Zimbabwe. But uh, the facts are these. 7.5 million people will die of hunger if they, something is not done between now and the next harvest season. UNICEF they just go to the bush for many reasons, including in Arare, Mavuku, Tafara, Chitunguiza, all those areas. We know that uh, 4.5 million in the greater Arare region are struggling to find water. There is no water, literally, in Harare. So this is a crisis of fundamental proportions. And if SADAC cannot be pushed to act, not because there is some political violence or anything, but because of this humanitarian crisis that is unfolding, mm -hmm. who is SADAC? What kind of a region is it? And but I differ with Mtuma slightly. I think that Minister Naled laid a clear path of SADC's intervention into the Zimbabwean crisis. And this is the solidarity to Zimbabwe through the uh, lift sanctions core. But solidarity cannot just be about governments. It has to go to the basis of people-to-people -people solidarity. And Minister Nalaid Pando says, in her own words, it has to be a collective responsibility. And South Africa cannot shoulder this blame or this burden on its own. Mm. It's time for Southern governments to step up, take initiative on the basis of the lead that has been shown by Minister Naled Pando and the South African but government. Taking, taking from, from what Mr. Moduma actually is saying, that there's certain limitations which prevent or some, some sort of way... In fact, if, if you could give the vote to Minister Naled Pando to vote, she can't vote in Zimbabwe. The problems of Zimbabwe has to be solved by the people of Zimbabwe. And that's but, where... But although we cannot, you know, if, you know realistically you can... so shy away from the fact that SADC has a responsibility to play, but mm. I actually want um, Mr. Mutandiri to, you know, to, yeah. to take from what you've actually just mentioned now. Yeah. When it comes to he's saying that South Africa has mentioned that some sort of way or solution on helping better the situation in Zimbabwe. However, on the other side, you're saying that there's certain limitations or certain boundaries that SADC or South Africa cannot reach. What's your take on that? Do you so, think so, that it's, so it's almost impossible no. for South Africa or SADC to really step in, both feet in Zimbabwe and actually assist? So this is the reality. The Zimbabwean government is signed to international statutes, to SADAC statutes, and the right to protect is not just about the Zimbabwean government. So the South African government in 2008, led by President Tawambeki and later Moshande, we saw them helping Zimbabwe birth an inclusive government. Uh, out of the crisis that we were having. Mm. So I understand the limitations that um, Tunga is raising, but quite clearly, SADAC understands what the crisis is. Mm. And for the first time, uh, we have a minister of South Africa who accepts that there is a crisis in Zimbabwe and not just qualify that crisis as a, as, as a social crisis or an economic crisis, that whatever we do, we have to deal with the fundamental political questions that Zimbabwe is facing, which is what Mutuma raises, the issues of the rule of law. The government cannot just unleash the military and the police to beat up innocent and armed people. Mm. And those are the questions that SADAC must begin to take up. The difficulty of the process is a separate issue, but SADA can take the lead in protecting life. Zimbabweans actually, are dying I actually want us to hold this conversation okay. and continue after the ad break. And perhaps I want us to, to ask ourselves the question when we return after the break, how long can Zimbabweans actually be patient? Well, on that note, we now take a short break and we continue this conversation.